With Vladimir Putin threatening to ramp up the conflict in Ukraine, is it time for the West to take a tougher stance against Russia? I'll ask former chess champion and leading Putin critic Gary Kasparov. I'm Mehdi Hassan, also on the show. The controversial new Filipino president, Rodrigo Duterte's crackdown on drugs has led to the deaths of more than 700 people at the hands of what critics say are basically death squads. I'll ask the president's spokesman, what's the future for human rights in the Philippines? But first, tensions between Russia and Ukraine escalated this week when Vladimir Putin accused Kiev of plotting terrorist attacks in Crimea. My guest today says it's time for the West to get behind Ukraine and stop appeasing what he calls the dictatorial regime of President Putin. But is that a recipe for more bloodshed? This week's headliner, former chess grandmaster, Russian exile and leading Putin critic Gary Kasparov. <music> Gary Kasparov, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Uh, you would like the West, uh, the United States government, President Obama, NATO, the EU, to take a tougher stance against uh, President Vladimir Putin and against the Russian government. Why? I would prefer to call him a dictator, to call him who he is. He's in power for nearly 17 years, and he has no intention of uh, leaving power voluntarily. Um, and the problems uh, Putin caused for Russia, as I predicted many times uh, uh, for years, uh, they eventually became everybody's problems, since every dictator, uh, when he runs out of enemies inside the country, he looks for enemies elsewhere, since his propaganda machine needs enemies to um, keep uh, um, his subjects um, uh, alarmed about threats uh, that uh, could be a justification of unlimited stay in power. OK, but there's no actual evidence, is there, uh, that a more aggressive or confrontational stance by the West against Russia uh, would make Vladimir Putin uh, less authoritarian or less dictatorial, to use your phrase, or make the average Russian or Crimean more free? There's no evidence that more aggression on the West part would achieve that solution. Uh, I don't like the word aggression, you know. I prefer the word deterrence. Uh, you know, unless we ignore history completely, we should learn a simple lesson, that uh, early deterrence always uh, saved lives because it prevented an aggressor from further actions. And appeasement always led to more confrontations and eventually to big wars. Um, as I said, you know, uh, deterrence in case of Georgia in 2008 uh, stronger action after Putin's annexation of Crimea in, in March 2014 could, you know, help uh, helped Eastern Ukrainians to avoid a nightmare and stronger actions against uh, Putin uh, in, in Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, could, could have helped uh, thousands and maybe tens of thousands of lives of innocent Syrians that have been ca carpet bombed by Putin. But what does a deterrent look like against Russia, in your view? Would you like to see a military confrontation with Russia? Uh, would you want to see a confrontation over the skies of Syria or on the ground in Ukraine? Surely that's what would lead to another world war. That would risk nuclear war. Uh, that's, the, that's, that's totally false premises because, again, from history we know that early deterrence prevented wars. During the Cold War, America and, and Europe faced the uh, Soviet Union, which was much more powerful than Vladimir Putin. And uh, we know that strong stand of presidents like Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, eventually you know, stopped Soviet aggression in many parts of the world. Uh, it, it looked very dangerous, but we know that the opposite ideas of detente, of uh, appeasement, they led to, to um, uh, tougher confrontations. In case of Ukraine, it was very simple. From the very beginning, the West could impose strong sanctions on Russian companies, on Russian banks, and support Ukraine with lethal weapons. Nobody talked about boots on the ground. But they have imposed strong sanctions, Gary. The U.S. has imposed no, tough no, no, sanctions no, no, on Russia's biggest bank, no, 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 on no, no, Russian no, no, defense on, the, companies. They just don't insult they my, 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 my intellect. Look, they, they, they did impose sanctions. But first of all, there are so many more things that they could have done by preventing Putin from moving further. Because at the end of the day, dictator depends on his entourage, on his inner circle. And so far, all these people could see is a weakness on the side of the West, of the free world, and toughness and confidence on, the, on, on, on Putin's side. And also, sanctions is not just about you know, concrete measures that are being imposed today. It's about psychological climate. 
Every month, every week, every day, we were hearing noises from many European countries, even in the United States, about lifting sanctions. And as long as dictator can, pro can project you know, his strengths, telling his people that sanctions will be lifted maybe next month, maybe in six months, maybe soon, you know, the, the effect of the sanctions, psychological effect, is being lost. Maybe that's because studies show that sanctions don't always work and harm ordinary people. But just on your specific point about providing lethal weapons uh, to Ukraine, that's not going to defeat Putin either, is it? Uh, the international relations scholar John Mearsheimer says advocates of arming Ukraine fail to understand that for Russian leaders, Ukraine is one of their core strategic interests. They're not going to give ground. They will absorb huge costs. The West can't absorb the same cost because Ukraine is not a core strategic interest for the West in the way it is for Putin. That's just a reality, isn't it, Gary? Look, you know, this is the, this is the, look, this is the oldest experts. They are insulting 45 million Ukrainians. Ukraine is not a buffer state. I heard this language in 1938 and 1939. All these you know, predecessors of the so-called political experts, they have been saying that Czechoslovakia, Poland, you know, Eastern Europe is not important for the security of France, Britain, and the free world. You know, it's, a, it's insulting you know, to, to, to uh, make an assumption that Ukrainians, they are doomed to be part of the Russian empire uh, as long as Kremlin wants it. But Gary, aren't you insulting? No, I'm not. I'm not insulting. Aren't anybody. you insulting I'm, the intelligence of viewers of who are hearing no you say that is. Putin is this new Hitler? He's expansionist. He's uh, threatening. He's aggressive. But if we provide some lethal weapons to the Ukrainian government, he'll run away. He's not going to run away. You're just going to escalate the conflict. It's not about running away. You know, it's it's about providing people in Ukraine or in any other nation that is fighting against aggression, comfort and psychological confidence that the free world is behind them. Don't forget, in 1994, and maybe your viewers, very intelligent viewers, are not aware of the fact that in 1994, under pressure from the United States and the United Kingdom, Ukraine gave up the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world to Russians, receiving guarantees of its territorial integrity. No one's questioning that point, Gary. It's a very good point you make. But what do you do about it? You are not telling us what is your military solution. Gary, what is your military solution in Ukraine? Do you believe there should be a war between NATO and Russia in Ukraine on the ground? What is your solution? The problem is eventually if Putin crosses Estonian, Latvian, Lithuanian border, which he could do, then he will be confronting NATO. And that's again going back to the 70s, going back to any other confrontation between the free world and dictators in the past. We know that appeasement always encouraged dictators to move further. Dictators never ask why, they always ask why not. They are not stopped before being stopped uh, by someone else. Do you, do you want the US government to try and uh, topple Vladimir Putin, to try and push for his departure from power? Because even under Ronald Reagan, who you greatly admired, he worked with Mikhail Gorbachev. He signed treaties with him to end the Cold War. It was never the US policy to try and be anti the leader of the Soviet Union, as you want it to be today. You want it to be anti-dictator Putin, you say. Look, you know, um, if you mention Reagan, don't forget that Gorbachev at that time was forced to negotiate because uh, um, the Soviet Union was badly losing the war in Afghanistan, thanks, by the way, to the supply of lethal weapons to Afghan rebels by the U.S. government. And no, overshading no there, is a there. great thing. And I'm all in favor of diplomacy. I'm, I'm not in favor of abandoning your own principles and giving up uh, territories, countries, and nations to the aggressor. Reagan never considered anything to communism. And by the way, Reagan faced Soviet Union. And don't tell me that Vladimir Putin today uh, is, is more dangerous than Stalin's uh, Soviet Union, Brezhnev's, or Andropov's. How clever, how strategically brilliant is Vladimir Putin in your view? A lot of Republican politicians in the US have said that Putin is playing chess while Obama is playing checkers. Uh, as a former chess grandmaster yourself, do you rate Putin as a chess player on the geopolitical stage? Uh, is he a master strategist? No, absolutely not. You know, I have to defend the integrity of my, of my game. Uh, dictators don't play chess because chess is a transparent game. Everything done by your opponent is, is, is in front of you. Um, dictators, they are more like poker players uh, because they prefer to bluff. Uh, they can play with a very weak hand by raising stakes uh, and, and uh, uh, um, um, uh, checking the um, resilience of, of their opponents. And unfortunately, uh, there are many situations uh, in, the, in the current geopolitical um, affairs where the, the leaders of the free world, uh, starting with Obama, fold cards while having a very, very strong hand. Isn't it the case 
that for all his authoritarianism, for all the crackdowns on civil liberties and on the media in Russia, for all the questions that have rightly been raised about how free or fair his election victories have been, Vladimir Putin, regardless, is still a popular leader at home. Russians have rallied around him. They see him as a strong defender of Russian power and prestige in a hostile and turbulent world. Look, you know, uh, if you have only one restaurant in town and only one dish served in this restaurant, this dish will be very popular. Uh, Russian propaganda machine, you know, controls the entire media space, 24-7 propaganda, which could be even that worse than in the Soviet Union because at least in old days, uh, there were some bright ideas about the future, though of course we knew these ideas were fakes, but at least they pretended that they were looking for some, some kind of, of um, um, uh, bright future. Uh, while today, Putin's propaganda machine is, is, is the most poisonous um, I ever heard of, uh, and it's all about confrontation, it's all about enemies, but we don't know what Russian people really think because we never had, uh, uh, in, you know, for a very long time, free and fair elections, and Putin never was a part of a single debate. You say we don't know what they think. A peer-reviewed study by four U.S. academics last year concluded, our estimates suggest support for Putin of approximately 80%. We conclude that Putin's approval ratings largely reflect the attitudes of Russian citizens. You're in a minority, Gary. You can blame the media or propaganda, but the fact is you're in a minority amongst your fellow Russians, aren't you, when it comes to Putin? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. If these academ academics run a, run a survey in, in Nazi Germany or in Stalin's Soviet Union, they would find 100% of support. You know, it's just, when you have a dictator in power, how can you expect people to be honest when they are responding to a question asked by, uh, anonymously by the telephone or by a stranger who is uh, asking them on the street or knocking at their door? This study actually took into account your criticism. It didn't actually ask specifically about Putin. But just moving on to you yourself and where you live now, you live abroad, you don't live in Russia. Are you living abroad because you fear for your life or are you living abroad because you can't work freely in Russia? Yeah, I, I can go back, but I will never be able to leave the country. Vladimir Putin's most vocal opponents, either in jail, in exile or dead. That's a fact. And uh, yeah, again, we look at the, at, at, at the, uh, at the um, state of uh, domestic affairs in Russia, so-called elections, and it's totally dominated by Vladimir Putin and his cronies. Nobody can do anything through the legal process. And again, he's in power for 17 years, and he's not going anywhere. It's a dictatorship. You know, we heard many people defending either Soviet Union or Nazi Germany, you know, before, before it, it became unbearable. But you heard a lot, of, a lot of talks about, you know, Adolf Hitler in 1936 or 1937, or about Stalin at the same time. That, of course, you know, it's not democratic, but the moment I hear this but about Vladimir Putin, I'm thinking about people who are being burned alive now in Syria, where Vladimir Putin's carpet bombs, you know, uh, uh, Syrian, Syrian uh, um, hospitals and schools uh, supporting his crony Bashar al-Assad, a butcher of, of Damascus. You, you, ran for, you tried to run for president almost a decade ago, back in 2007. Do you hope to one day run again? Sounds like not. If, it, if Russia is Nazi Germany in, in the making, clearly you can never go back and you'll never ever have a free political system, from what you're saying. Oh, yeah. By the way, I just, you know, let me tell you and your listeners, I will come back to Russia. Vladimir Putin is a dictator and every dictator ends up, you know, the same way. Whether it's we, like Gaddafi, Saddam Hussein, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, but he's going to disappear and it will be a very you know, um, painful end for Vladimir Putin and his cronies. The question is not what, what happens with Putin. The question is when it happens and what price my country and the rest of the world will pay for the demise of this uh, brutal dictator. Gary Kasparov, thanks for joining me on Upfront. The Olympics are well underway in Rio, but they're missing one prominent face. The country's suspended president, Dilma Rousseff, who is in the middle of impeachment proceedings. Isn't it great, though, that so many of Brazil's honest, upright, righteous politicians are taking action against the allegedly corrupt and law-breaking Dilma? Well, maybe not. Acting President Michel Temer, the guy who took the top job off of Dilma, is himself actually banned from running for president for eight years for violating campaign finance rules. Not to mention there are also calls now for him to be impeached as well. And three of his ministers have had to stand down over allegations of bribery or attempts to stifle a corruption probe. With apologies to Oscar Wilde, to lose one minister over corruption might be a misfortune. To lose two, careless. To lose three is just brazen hypocrisy. One of those three, by the way, was the transparency minister. Yeah, he resigned over corruption claims. Oh, Brazilian politics, you spoil.
spoil us. But surely the so-called mastermind behind Dilma's impeachment, Eduardo Cunha, he must be busy celebrating his attempt to bring Dilma to justice. Uh, not quite. The former Speaker of the Lower House of Congress was himself forced to stand down and charged with taking nearly $40 million in bribes. His counterpart in the Senate, Renan Calieros, is also being investigated for taking bribes. Of the 65 members on a commission to impeach Dilma, 37 of them, that's more than half, face charges of corruption or other crimes. And of the 513 members of Brazil's Lower House of Congress, 303 of them are either being investigated or being charged with a range of criminal offences from corruption to homicide to slavery. Yes, I did just say slavery. The same is true for 49 of the country's 81 senators who will be voting on whether to impeach Dilma. Look in the mirror, folks. Look in the mirror. And this isn't about whether Dilma's innocent or guilty. I'm not saying she's squeaky clean. But when the people trying to impeach her are accused of the same stuff that she is, in some cases, worse stuff, then it's clear that ridding Brazil of a corrupt leader isn't what's motivating them. So look, if the country's politicians want to go after their allegedly corrupt president, fine. But didn't Jesus once say something about he who's without sin casting the first stone? Just saying. He's been president of the Philippines for just six weeks and already he's threatening martial law. Rodrigo Duterte, the controversial Filipino leader who took office in June, despite a record of backing death squads, joking about rape and insulting the Pope, is now implementing his so-called war on drugs. The result? More than 700 people dead in what Human Rights Watch has called government-sanctioned butchery. Joining me now from Manila is President Duterte's spokesman, Ernesto Abelia. Um, Ernesto Abelia, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Your boss, President Duterte, has been in office less than two months, yet more than 700 Filipinos dead, many of them the poorest members of society, killed without any due process, many just shot in the street. How can you even begin to try and justify what one Catholic priest in your country has called a bloodbath? Well, basically, we have to see it from the other perspective, where he sees the whole thing from. He sees that the, the nation is really engulfed in a clear and present danger of a drug menace. And if you actually look at it, the results are that there are about 700,000 people on a five, 500,000, more than 500,000 people who have already surrendered. So there is another perspective to the whole thing. But Human Rights Watch has called this ongoing spree of extrajudicial killings in the Philippines government-sanctioned butchery. That's you and your colleagues, Ernesto Abelio, that they're accusing of butchery. I can understand where they're coming from, but it really, Mr. Duterte has said again and again that he does not condone extrajudicial killings. You're suggesting that he doesn't condone extrajudicial killings, even though kill lists have been handed out, people have been shot in cold blood in the street. Uh, the president himself says he does not care about human rights, and if he orders the killing of someone, he can't be arrested because I have immunity, he says. Uh, surely you don't agree with that. He's not above the law, is he? He's not above the law. In fact, he knows, he knows the limits of the law. But again and again, he has also specified that the people, that the, uh, the, the police are meant to act within the presumptions of regularity. And so this is where he's coming from. He, he, there's a lot of rhetoric going on, but they also need to see that there is a lot of response coming, in fact, with the surrenderees. Let me uh, read a line to you from The Atlantic magazine reporting on what's going on in the Philippines. Vigilantes killed a man who mocked the new national police chief. They shot up a cemetery and killed five people, including a mother and her son, celebrating her birthday, leaving behind one sign for all of them. They killed a teenager feeding his dog who had no ties to drugs. You're a former evangelical preacher. When you read stuff like this, when you see images of people lying dead in the street, some of them in the arms of their loved ones, does that not bother you at all? This vigilantism, this violence, it's not very Christian, is it? Where's the mercy? What basically is happening is that the president is responding in a very, in a very firm way, with responding in a very firm way to what has happened to the country. So that there is another perspective to this. And this perspective is that the nation is being flooded with drugs. And the extent, of, the extent to which the nation has been flooded has not been revealed only until now. 
And so that is exactly what is happening. But even when the nation is being flooded by drugs, uh, as human rights groups and many journalists have pointed out, it's not the top drug kingpins who are being taken out in these attacks. It's people who are, you know, drive, riding rickshaws. People, the poorest members of society are being taken out on the streets. Uh, you're not tackling the core of the problem. This is state-sponsored violence. This is, I mean, the president promised 100,000 dead people would be dropped into Manila Bay. How can you justify rhetoric like that? Well, let's put it this way. He has addressed it by, for example, number one, kill, uh, cleaning, cleaning, up, cleaning up the prisons, uh, addressing the fact that... Uh, we don't um, need prison if you're killing the, the people before they get there, the, do you? Well, there are people in prison, and that's where the drugs are coming from. This isn't just about human rights or, or ethics. It's also an issue of security and stability. Yours is a country that is struggling to put down both so-called Islamist insurgencies and communist insurgencies. And this so-called war on drugs so soon into a new presidential term is only going to make your country more violent, uh, more chaotic, more unstable and more isolated on the international stage. Does that not worry you at all, a new government? If you were here, you would see that there is peace beginning to settle into the land. I'm not saying, I'm not, for the, the picture that you're drawing seems to be a little bit dark and dreary. However, from where the people are coming from, there is a sense of, there's a sense of security coming in. That the things that have been, that ought to have been addressed years back is now being addressed by somebody who has a firm political will. You say I'm painting a dark and dreary picture. Uh, let me ask you this, more than 700 people have been killed since the president took office less than two months ago. Is that 700 too many or 700 too few in your view? From my view, the 500,000 people who have already surrendered... With is respect, a Ernesto Abelli, that's that not what I asked. Is 700 people dead too many I or understand. too few? Uh, you're putting it, you're framing it in a way that puts me as if I was a sadistic murderer. Not you at know, all, because you can to say, say it's too many. I'm not, I'm not forcing you to say anything. It's a very simple question. Uh, have too many people been killed in the Philippines? You said he, the president doesn't condone this violence. Have this too many been not, killed? Yes or no? This ought not to be happening. This, this ought not to be happening if it had been addressed when years back. Now, what I'm saying is that these, all, the, all these things that are happening right now are simply a cleaning up that, has, that ought to have been done years back. It's not just... Uh, drug dealers uh, that the president is going after. He's also threatened journalists, too. He said in a press conference earlier this year, just because you're a journalist, you're not exempted from assassination if you're an SOB. I'm not going to use the full phrase that he used. He has very colorful, offensive language. But that's an outrageous thing to say about journalists, isn't it? What he, was what he's what he actually meant, and I'm not trying to spin him, what he actually meant was that there are people who use journalism as a cover for being used by for being used for gain, for trying to come out with new. He calls them, he calls uh, these are not real journalists. They're not the bona fide journalists are are fine, but there are people who use journalism as a mask and a cover. But you accept that in a country like the Philippines, which is one of the top 10 most dangerous places for journalists in the world, hundreds of journalists killed since the 1980s, you think that was irresponsible of the president to make remarks, off-the-cuff remarks, about assassinating journalists? As I said, he was not referring to bona fide journalists. Okay. He was referring to those who use journalism. Okay, so those who use journalism should be assassinated, is your view? He's not saying that they should be assassinated. He's just saying that. No, no, that's these what he said. With to respect, Ernesto Abelio, you said you're not spinning him, so don't spin him. What he exactly said is just because you're a journalist, you're not exempted from assassination. His words, not mine, not yours. They were not journalists. Okay. And they were not assassinated. But, they, but they, should, should people who are pretending to be journalists be assassinated? I'm not saying that they should be assassinated. Well, that's what your so boss has said. It's so happened that, well, I think you're taking it out of context. Okay, I, I, I took his I assassination to remark already. out of context. Is it difficult being a press spokesman for a president who speaks in such controversial and many would say offensive ways? A president who says he'd kill his own kids if they took drugs, who threatens to bomb the houses of elected mayors, who makes jokes about wanting to rape women, who's called the US ambassador a gay SOB and the Pope a son of a prostitute. Well, actually, a much worse word than prostitute. Your job must surely be an impossible one having to spin for him. Let's put it this way. If you under I understand that there is a culture clash in here. But I understand where he's coming from because, that it, because it's a particular subculture. The Cebuana subculture speaks in a very rough kind of humor. 
But I understand that's, that's, that's why my task is to be able to interpret him and act as a conduit and, and bring out the true intention of the president. What was the true intention when he said he wished he had raped a woman before she had been gang raped? The true intent, it was, it was, it was a joke that was, it's difficult to, it, No, he said, he said, he said afterwards, I'm not joking, I wasn't smiling, there's no joke, it wasn't a joke, he says. So it makes your job very hard when you're trying to defend him. I'm not trying to defend him, I'm simply trying to act as a conduit for him. It's a, it's a tricky job, Ernesto Abelio, thanks for joining me on Upfront. That's our show, the new series of Upfront will be back in September.